in the bottom. Okay. Yeah, you get. So then let's start. Mm -hmm. So, good morning, good afternoon, good e good evening, and good midnight. Uh, welcome to our the global AI interactive session of CBPR 2020. Uh, actually, today is the last day of re regular session of club the CBPR, and. Uh, also, so today is the last interactive session of Global AI Boost. And uh, today session, today's topic of our session is toward reliable learning and reliable machine learning in computer vision. And the uh, presenters are Sang Hyuk Jun and Jun Sok Choi. So uh, let's uh, thanks for speakers to uh, talk. Let's start. Please start. Thank you, Okay. Um, thanks, Jung, for introducing. Um, so I'm Sang Hyuk Jun, um, as Jung said. Uh, so today's talk is about some reliable machine learning um, done by Club AI Research, and we, um, me, and Jun Sok Choi will um, represent uh, will present um, this topic. Uh, yeah, before I start the talk, uh, let me briefly introduce what we do and who we are. Um, so Naver is the largest search engine in Korea, um, and also Line is the uh, one of the major mobile messenger in Japan and Southeast Asia. And Clova AI is AI-centric um, organization in Naver, um, which uh, we usually focusing on some multimedia processing like um, speech or um, vision. And research is one of the most uh, important thing in Clova AI. So we are making many progresses on um, AI related conferences. Uh, yeah, so as Jung said, um, anyone who has interested in Clova AI, please um, take this QR code in the right top side. And also if you have any question about anything, um, you can leave the message at the chat. We will um, address after the <coughs> talk. Yeah, thanks. So we have many papers um, from 2017. So we are getting, getting, getting better and, and publish more and more papers. So there are some selected papers related to the vision. Uh, and if you're interested in more about our researches, you can find more at um, the link in the below. And we are uh, collaborating with global um, research centers of neighbor, uh, like in um, neighbor labs Europe in France or a line brain in Japan. So we are doing very global researches. Okay, so let's move to the, um, the topic of reliable machine learning. So we have finally working machine learning stuff. Um, yeah, it's good because we, now, now we can do many things using machine learning. Um, we have many um, fascinating um, applications like AI speaker, uh, which is um, enabled by uh, better speech recognition or speech synthesis, natural language understanding or recommendation. And also neural uh, language, I don't know, neural machine translation enables very high quality uh, machine translations without any human annotators. And of course we have OCR um, by better text detection, recognition and document understanding. And even more, we can generate um, human handwriting uh, by a uh, true type font with very few number of uh, reference samples. So you can find the details in the um, link I uh, put it here. So, and also this um, talk slide and videos will be publicly available in the web later. So you can access anytime you want. And it is because due to the uh, human level performances of the machine models on real world problems. For instance, um, state of the art uh, vision classifiers achieve much better um, accuracy than humans. And also, it is true for the um, complex and difficult NLP tasks, tasks like um, uh, question answering or reasoning, um, um, syntax parsing, or something like that. Um, yeah, so we have very good models now. So we can do um, more things than we have, like medical AI or personalized recommendations, um, which will bring us very, 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 very important um, values in our future. Um, but 
problem is they are actually not reliable. For instance, um, could you believe the decision by medical AI, which just um, produced the numbers, only one number, um, like this is a cancer or this is not a cancer. Could you believe it without any explanation? So it is quite problem problematic. And also even in recommendation, um, we know it is very powerful and brings very, very high profit. But we, know, we also know that it is very easily biased, um, like filter bubble or um, some, other, some, uh, some other not good um, biases. So what are the issues of this reliability and how can we solve the problem um, in terms of research? First of all, um, we have to tackle this uh, lack of transparency and human interpretability of the models. And we know that they are very vulnerable to some other like um, various kinds of perturbations or corruptions and not any other things. So as you can see here, um, this simple demo shows that um, with this weird um, image patchy in the real world, uh, physically it um, easily fooled the um, detector. So as you can see here, the detector failed to um, detect person uh, with this a uh, weird patch. So it is really happening now. And even more, um, they don't know what they don't know. So um, assume you have some um, classifier with very high accuracy and performance, and assume you have some occluded um, digit like this. Um, yeah, it still say it is 47 because, you know, this is just occluded sample by 47. But you know, it could be 97 or 77 or um, 17. We don't know that. So um, it's not good just predicting everything is 100% accuracy, 100% uh, prediction. Uh, we may need better uncertainty estimation. And these kind of problems are um, originated by the fundamental difference between machines and humans. Um, so in terms of research, um, there are three different um, things for um, how is machine learning different from humans. The first one is um, lack of interpretability, of course. So we are going to talk about some localization for evaluating interpretable attribute maps. Um, and second, they are non-robust. So we are going to um, talk about some debiasing models. And last, um, they are too confident or they don't have proper uncertainty estimation. Um, yeah, it could be um, mitigated by probability machine learning, um, which will not be covered in this talk, but also we, we also have some progress on in this topic too. Okay, so um, this is the end of the introductory and let's go to the transparent machine learning. So let me introduce Jun Sok Choi um, for um, presenting this topic. Uh, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Jun Sok Choi. Uh, today I will introduce our work on transparent machine learning. Uh, <clears throat> uh, we do not know why the model think like that. So some people say that the deep learning model is a black box. However, it is, it is important to know uh, the reasoning of the model. Uh, for this purpose, many transparent smart methods are proposed. CAM is one of the most popular interpretable methods for CNN. <coughs> CAM produces a score map that represents which pixel is important for classification. Specifically, the score map uh, is produced by analyzing the feature information uh, in the penalty mate layer and the weights of the fully connected layers. Uh, based on the assumption that reasoning should be similar to humans, uh, many transparent methods use object localization to evaluate uh, their transparency model. And that means good transparency model should cover the entire extent of the object. Uh, this task is 
are called as weekly supervised object localization. Uh, the question here is that how close they are to estimated mass and the ground truth. Uh, we measure this by uh, evaluation, of course. Unfortunately, uh, current WSOR evaluation is problematic. Now, we will show what is wrong with WSOR evaluation and how to fix it. Uh, in this conference, we introduced a new evaluation protocol and data set for WSOL. This work was done uh, in collaboration with Professor Jaina Makata from University of Tübingen and Seung Lee from Yonsei University and Professor Han Jung Shim from Yonsei University. Uh, <clears throat> this paper first considers what is wrong with previous evaluation protocol of WSOL. For example, uh, they are not actually weakly supervised. After that, we will show how to fix the issues. So what is the weakly supervised object localization? Uh, before introducing object localization, I introduced the relevant test. Uh, first, classification is to recognize what object is in the image. For example, uh, in this image, it is sufficient to say that there is a cat in this image. On the other hand, semantic segmentation is to label each pixel of an image with a corresponding class. Uh, instance segmentation is to classify individual objects uh, in pixel level. Uh, in summary, Segmentation is to uh, a segment test. Segmentation test assumes that there are multi classes in the image, and the classes are not known. In other words, the question of segmentation test is, what and where is the object in this image? On the other hand, the question of object localization is, where is the object? So. The object localization assumes that there is only a single class, and also we know the class. Uh, the output of object localization are foreground and background mask. So in this case, uh, the question is, where is the cat? And the answer is the cat mask. Object localization can be divided according to the types of supervision. First, full supervision means that we have mask notations for training the model. Next, the strong supervision uh, has more powerful type of information such as part notation. A weak supervision do not have perfect information about the lo location of object. Uh, image level class labels uh, indicate whether there is the target class in this image. This Image level label is one of example, uh, one example of weak provision for localization. Uh, in this paper, we focus on weakly supervised object localization using image level class labels. And that means uh, we train the model only with image level labels, but we localize uh, object during testing. Here is an example of weekly supervised object localization framework. Uh, CAM method produces a score map uh, from input image using this classification CNN classifier. Uh, this score map represents the importance of each pixel for classification. In general, uh, the important information for classification occurs on the extent of the object. Hence, the score map also highlights uh, the object. And then uh, the foreground mask is computed by, uh, the foreground mask is computed by thresholding this score map. In this way, we can localize the object without full localization supervision. So far, 
it looks like that uh, we do not use any full localization supervision for localization. However, the first provision is actually required for tuning the score map thresholding hyperparameter. So we call this type of first provision as implicit first provision. Let me give an example. Uh, we firstly set the threshold to 0 0.25. Now, using this hyperparameter, we get the validation performance 74.3%. Uh, we want to improve the validation performance, hence we use uh, we try different threshold. Uh, here, we set the threshold to 0 0.3, then the validation performance increases to 82.9%. So we actually use full localization supervision uh, to find proper hyperparameter. Actually, the number of hyperparameters of WSOL methods is far more than that of common classification training. Prior methods have addressed this issue by using additional information or full localization supervision. Uh, specifically, the authors of hide and seek uh, visually inspect a few qualitative results on training data uh, for tuning the hyperparameter. And SPG, find the optimal hyperparameters using a great search algorithm. Clearly, this practice is against the philosophy of WSOL. Uh, this is because WSOL assumes that there is only image level class level. However, the implicit first provision for WSOL is actually inevitable. We will show why WSOL is not solvable only with image level labels. These dog images are sampled randomly from Flickr. We observe that the feet, feet of dog, rarely occurs in this toy data set. Uh, on the other hand, water occurs more frequently. As a result, the dog class correlates better better with the water than the dog's feet. This can be considered as context, contextual bias. Due to this bias, WSOL is not solvable. For more detail, please see number 3.1 3 in the paper. So let's use full provision for WSOL. But the important thing is that we have to use it in a controlled manner. As we mentioned before, uh, each paper used different amount of additional full supervision. Hide and seek utilize human inspection while SPG use full localization annotations. Moreover, most papers do not reveal their additional supervision they used. Hence, uh, we argue that we should use explicit validation set with full localization annotations for tuning the hyperparameters. Uh, note that the training split only has uh, image level labels, and the test split should be used for final emulation, not for tuning the hyperparameters. Uh, unfortunately, uh, these two popular data sets for WSOL do not provide the explicit validation set. For example, the test split uh, of ImageNet dataset is not available now. Uh, COB dataset do not provide any validation set. There is nothing. Hence, we make validation set on our own. Uh, for ImageNet, we use ImageNet V2 uh, as our validation set. Unfortunately, the ImageNet V2 does not provide localization notation, so we manually collect them. Uh, for COB data set, there is no images, so we crawl bird images from Flickr and then annotate them. In addition, we process a massive open images V6 and make a new compact data set for WSOL. 
uh, this, this data set is called as uh, open image third K. Uh, so this open image third K includes about 30K images. And most importantly, open images provide mask notations, while these two data sets provide only box notations. As a result, we can evaluate uh, WSO methods more accurately on this data set. Uh, on, the, on the validation set, we tune the hyperparameters. Uh, specifically, we sample 30 hyperparameter combinations randomly, random search. Then we train the models and evaluate them on the validation set. Finally, we select top one hyperparameter combination according to the validation performance. Uh, the another issue for WSO evaluation is the thresholding for score map. We believe that this score map is the natural output of WSO methods, whether the foreground mask. With the score map thresholding, the evaluation result may be misunderstood. Uh, for example, the score map from SPG looks like that it cannot cover the entire uh, extent of the object. However, with the optimal with the optimal threshold, the best intersectionable union is achieved by this SPG method. So, using a fixed threshold may be unfair. We propose to use the Oracle threshold for every method. To this end. We proposed two metrics uh, that do not depend on the score map threshold. Uh, if you have mass connotations, we advise to use PXAP. And Maxbox ACC is only recommended to use when there is only box connotations. For more detail about these metrics, please see the paper. Uh, the last issue for fair comparison is the data set and architecture used by each method. For example, ACOR used bridge architecture and SPG used inception architecture. Although they do not use, uh, they do not share the same backbone networks, they compare each other directly. Uh, we believe that this is less reasonable Yes, uh, we re-implement all six uh, WSL methods with three architectures and evaluate them, evaluate them on three data sets. Uh, and strikingly, there is no significant progress since CAM in WSOL. The performance of CAM is still competitive with other state-of-the-art uh, WSL methods. So we released the source code for six WSOL methods, these six methods, with three uh, network architectures, and we released the three data sets. Anyone can train WSOL methods easily using our uh, framework. So please visit this repository if you are interested. Now, uh, we have full localization notations for tuning the hyperparameters. What, uh, and we only use them for hyperparameters, but what if, uh, what if the validation samples are used for training model rather than tuning the hyperparameters? To answer this question, uh, we train a simple fully convolutional network using the few localization labels. There are only one to five full localization samples per class. Hence, we call this uh, few shot learning baseline. Ideally, WSOL methods should surpass this few shot learning baseline. However, this few shot learning baseline surpasses all WSOL methods with only two or three full provision 
per class. So we advise for the future WSOF researchers to use the few localization notations to train the model, not train the hyperparameters. <coughs> Uh, in conclusion, first, evaluation protocol is critical for advancing a field. Next, due to the improper evaluation, WSR has not improved for the past four years. Last, a small number of push provision may be better than numerous weak provision for object localization. Uh, Thanks for listening. And is there any questions? Oh, there is a question. Close the yeah, yeah, that is our point. We uh we believe that this score map is the true output of WSOR method. So we evaluate the score map itself, not, the, not using the foreground mask. Thank you for your question. So there is no question. So let me introduce Sangyo again. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks for the nice talk, Junsak. Um, yeah, it's me again. Um, I'm gonna talk about some robust machine learning um, um, researches in Clover recent. Um, yeah, as I said before, um, deep neural networks are not robust to various kinds of perturbations or corruptions. And they are even not robust to the biases or domains. So assume you are a service provider um, for some self-driving car um, service. So you are going to collect some traffic sign data for three months, which, uh, which would be very expensive in terms of the labor cost or um, data collection cost, right? Uh, so three months are not short time. But six months later, your company goes bankrupt because your models failed to generalize it to the winter um, traffic sign, right? Um, so it's very critical to the um, generalize your model to the different kind of biases in the real world um, deployment system. Um, so can we do better for different real world biases? Um, that is our question. Um, so before going um, deeply, uh, let me first um, define what is our problem. Um, so consider a very simple um, classifier, binary classifier, um, either classify boat or car. Um, and in your training data, of course, most of boat images have water pattern and most of car images have load patterns, right? Um, and in your test time, maybe you have some car on the water or a boat on the load. Um, but your model think, um, your model think boat images um, <clears throat> have water patterns and car images have load patterns, which means that they are major cue for recognition. So they will fail to um, correct recognition. Um, so here is our problem definition of cross bias generalization. <clears throat> um, so we assume that when bias cues are uh, shortcut for the uh, shortcut for the um, current task, uh, model first fails to generalize to unseen bias signal combinations. Um, yeah, simple solution of this problem would be collect all possible combinations for the training data. Problem is, it's not um, <clears throat> realistic. 
So it is mostly inevitable to gather every kind of, every sort of combination or biases in the real world. Um, the alternative way would be um, data generation. So assume you have some texture um, augmentation method. Uh, so this paper is um, pr presented in last iClear uh, from University of Tübingen. Um, they propose a good um, data augmentation method to um, mitigate the texture bias problem. So their solution um, slightly improves the robustness against to the um, texture bias, but it is not the um, global solution because we have to um, define full set of the textures of interest um, to solve the problem perfectly. However, um, it is almost impossible to get and um, define all possible textures in the world. Of course, it is expensive because we have to generate a lot of um, images to classify, I mean training. So here is our solution, um, <clears throat> paper named Running the Bias Representations with Bias Representations. Um, this paper is published in upcoming ICML. Um, this work is collaboration with Hyo Jin Bang from um, Korea University and Jae Gro Chu from KAIST, and Sang Do Yoon in Global Research and Sung Joon Oh in Global Research. Um, so here is the scenario when <clears throat> method sketch of our method. Um, so we assume that uh, with only original tax provision or the class labels, um, the model will fail to generalize across the biases or um, bias the, it will bias the model. Um, so we give another kind of supervision like be different. So here we assume model become less biased um, if we put another kind of supervision here, be different. Okay, um, so two questions here. First of all, um, how can we um, characterize bias with models? Because we assume, here we assume that um, there is no bias um, labels, but we define bias by set of these intentionally biased models. Um, so how can you characterize them? Second, how can we encode this be different? How can you measure this different measure? Um, so we are going to um, introduce um, the solution for these questions. <clears throat> so first of all, assume again, um, texture bias. And probably if you have very small reset, to, uh, if you, uh, your model has very big um, reset to field bias design, like VGG or ResNet has very big reset to fields like uh, almost 100 by 100 for each feature map. Um, so it is able to capture both local and global cues by its design, but there is no um, certain motivation to um, capture whole um, shape or global cues by this model. So uh, in general, uh, if you're just training data um, using such a uh, big network, um, it fails to make enlarging um, reset to field. On the other hand, if you have very small reset to field by its design, like um, replacing every three by three convolution filters to one by one convolution filter. Um, it should, I mean, it cannot be generalized to the shape. Um, so it only capture local cues like textures. So we believe that this kind of small reset to field would be a um, proxy measure of the um, texture bias here. <clears throat> okay, so we define two different models here. So our model is um, normal models like uh, ResNet or VGG, <clears throat> which has large list to field. And intentionally biased model is um, small list to field a model, like um, change every three by three convolution to the one by one convolution. Um, okay, so we, we have answer for this, how can we characterize the bias <clears throat> by the models? And second question is, how can we make them be different? Um, so maybe we can just um, computing some simple um, algebra, like um, mean squared error or mean absolute error, maybe. Uh, but problem is this kind of optimization has trivial solution, just increasing your weight norm. So assume your, um, your model has infinite um, value of the weight and the biased model has um, minus infinite value of the norm, then this value will be maximized. So it is not the correct answer. Um, so we use independence in this setting. Um, 
So independence is very good measure, of course. <clears throat> but problem is how can you measure and optimize independence between two neural networks? It is not clear. So we use H6 uh, measure, um, which is ablation of the <clears throat> um, Hilbert-Schmidt independence criterion. So this H6 measure is zero if and only if um, two random variables are independent. And good thing of this um, H6 measure is that we don't need the pure random variable, but it can be computed um, by um, finite number of samples from the uh, random variables. So there are many good um, theoretical guarantees or um, properties by this um, H6, but I will skip the details here. Um, but you know, this thing is very popular in many machine learning applications. So if you are interested in such applications, just um, follow these um, references. So here is our um, objective function. So this L is the original task, like um, classification cross entropy. And this H6 is um, some regularization term um, related to the independence between um, our model and the, uh, the biased model, <clears throat> like small receptive field. So we train this F, our target model, to be independent to G, while um, G is trained to be independent to F. So what does it mean? Um, oh yeah, and also in practice, we jointly optimize F and G by minimax optimization. So uh, F is optimized by original task and minimize H6, and G is optimized original task and maximizing H6, or uh, maximizing the dependency between F and G. So how it works? Um, let me show you some brief um, conceptual figure. So here, large F and large G are function space of the um, different, uh, different functions. Okay. <clears throat> um, and G is constrained by architecture design, like um, changing every three by three convolution layer to the one by one convolution. So it has restricted representation than large F. And assume we have initial points here, <clears throat> F0 and G0. First, we minimize um, this F function using the <clears throat> target task and the um, independence. And it you know, goes away from the G like this. <clears throat> and then we minimize or maximize um, the H6 between F and G while keeping the target task of the G. So G catch up F like this. And we again update F like this. G followed F. And after enough number of the iterations, um, G cannot catch up F due to the architecture constraint. Um, it is impossible to G is going out to be uh, out of this large G. So F, we think we can think F is the bias because we define bias as the set of the um, biased models or in this large G. So this is conceptual figure, but um, you may wonder, um, is this work really? So here is simple toy simulation. So this um, right upper side is um, our data setting. So we have two axes, um, bias and signal. Um, each class is highly correlated to the bias, um, and signal is the original signal, and bias is the, um, the bias, of course. So if we're just training random um, vanilla network with cross entropy, it will have like this, um, the diagonal distance boundary. And we assume some intentionally biased model which only see the bias. And when we apply this uh, minimax optimization framework to the, um, this network, we have very good um, distance boundary like this. So, okay, we think it works, but our problem is how can we evaluate the cross bias generalization problem in the real world? Um, yeah, so again, this picture, uh, let's simplify this one. So this is our problem scenario. Um, we have um, two axes here, bias and signal, and we assume that each class is highly um, correlated to the each bias. Um, and we want to evaluate um, unbiased performance, I mean, um, the biased um, data set test accuracy. So we have two problems here. First of all, um, as you can see here, um, the reason why we have training scenario like this is that um, these data points are very unusual combinations, like um, cars in air or um, ships in the galaxy or something. 
And the other problem is we don't know what is the bias in my data set. Um, unless you have some certain um, bias um, labels like gender or um, age or something like um, data set used in fairness. But here we may assume we use general data set like ImageNet or any other um, image classification. Um, so yeah, let's talk about the combination again. So here again, the boat on the load, um, traffic sign in the winter, um, car in the air, and elephant with zebra skin. Well, they are also um, in some combination by listing in this elephant, signalized elephant, and bias is zebra skin. Yeah, this is still a valid combination, but problem is it is not realistic or uh, it is unable to gather such images, right? So it's very difficult to measure um, this kind of cross bias generalization in real world. So we make some benchmarks here. So first of all, we make biased MNIST, um, the controllable synthetic data set. So here we inject colors to the background of each digit with the pre, uh, predefined colors for each co uh, class. So we inject um, predefined color with probability low and with one minus low probability, we randomly choose them from the other colors. Um, and the models also are characterized by the um, reset to field again. And this is our training scenario. So we set the low is almost one. Um, actually we use less than one because equals one is unable to, um, uh, there is no motiv motivation to learn any shape or global um, Q here. So we use low less than one, like um, 0 0.997, 0 0.999. And here is our test scenario. Um, we just set the low equals 0 0.1 because we have 10 classes, right? So this bias is 100% controllable and interpretable bias labels, I mean color. And, and this, um, this scars um, combinations is actually not scars because we can generate um, every combination uh, with very cheap, um, um, cheap cost. So here is our um, result. Um, so here is the bias accuracy of the vanilla training and inter, um, biased model or small reset to field model. And ours, of course, achieve 100% biased accuracy. And in the unbiased uh, setting, um, they fail, uh, previous models or baselines fails to generalize. And this 10% um, accuracy is exactly the same as the baseline, um, just see the bias only. But ours uh, just improve, way improve the um, accuracy in unbiased setting. Of course, we have some similar approaches, um, use um, various models or um, predefined um, biases. So we test them all together in this benchmark. And yeah, thankfully ours is still um, better than other uh, comparison method here. Okay, so the bias, our method is good at synthetic bias. It is proved. But will it work well in the real world biases too? It is another question. So we tested two different texture, uh, two different biases here. First one is texture biases in ImageNet. Um, again, ImageNet. And problem of this ImageNet is first, um, there is no specific bias label, of course. And the other one is, um, there is no way to collect this kind of unusual combination. So first of all, we uh, sample, subsample the class of ImageNet to the nine classes. And then we perform the texture clustering to um, get the texture labels. Here we run the um, k-means clustering with k equals nine on the VGG uh, feature, which is popular to stylization or texturization. Um, yeah, they use these features because um, it is known to be um, well capture um, textures. So we run. Um, texture clustering here, I mean, k-means clustering here, and we call the, these things as texture labels. And I think we have one um, question here, right? Okay, so um, question will be um, addressed after the um, this scenario. Um, so, where are we? Okay, so we have nine um, clusters like this, and we have nine classes. So there are nine by nine, combinations, 81 combinations, right? 
So this is our test, <clears throat> our scenario. So this bias label is texture clusters. And we compute accuracy of each combination uh, and measure the average over whole um, accuracy. Um, and you know, this text cluster could be random. So we report the average score from different three clustering learns. And we ignore these kind of um, known clusters or null clusters. Um, yeah, because these clusters are not perfect and uh, we can say there is no uh, combinations like um, dog in the water, for example, right? Um, and additional benchmarks um, to support our um, method is ImageNet A and ImageNet C. So ImageNet A is some failure examples by state-of-the-art deep networks, which is um, quite um, difficult examples. And ImageNet C is um, some benchmark to measure some uh, robustness against natural corruptions. So it just um, adds some adjective natural corruptions like this. And again, the model is characterized uh, by this um, reset to field again. And here is our results. Um, of course, the bias, of course, getting better results at biased accuracy and unbiased accuracy. Here, biased accuracy is standard um, validation accuracy of the ImageNet, and unbiased accuracy is the um, mean combination um, cell accuracy, of course. And there are some comparison methods here, and ours is still um, better than comparison methods, previous methods. And in the image in A, um, previous methods very to get high performance here. Uh, of course, ours is still worse, but uh, not good, but it is much better than um, the vanilla training. And it is also true for the other um, comparison methods. Image C, um, has similar results, um, but here this um, green column is stylized ImageNet, which is um, data augmentation. So as you can see here, um, ImageNet C just adds some noises like this, and this ImageNet C augments some um, textures to generate some augmentation. So we think that it is quite reasonable to get higher accuracy in the image and see by uh, stylized image net. But our method has still good, uh, achieved better, uh, good results um, without any data augmentation. Okay, the last one. Um, it is statical, uh, static contextual bias in action recognition. So this is the real data set um, example. So this class is kayaking. And maybe the model thing, okay, this kayaking action this is action, so we should classify the action of the person in the video. But the model has to, uh, no more motivation to focus on the human. So they will correctly classify the kayak even if we uh, remove the person in the video. It, it will achieve certain um, confidence with the high, uh, high confidence, I mean. Um, so we use MIMTIC's data set um, proposed by Neighbors to Europe last year. Um, so this data set collect the um, out of context human action methods, I'm uh, sorry, data sets from YouTube. So yeah, this is namely MIME. So they have no contextual bias here. So um, the model should correctly classify the left video as kayaking, but you know, it is quite difficult if your model only focuses on this kind of water patterns. Um, so here the model again. So our model used 3D convolution to capture whole um, temporal, um, temporal reset to field. And the biased model only used 2D convolution filter to um, ignore the temporal features. So here is the results. Um, so in the kinetic standard accuracy, um, ours is getting um, slightly better. And in the unbiased accuracy, we achieved 6% um, point better and the other comparison methods very to be generalized. Okay, so here is conclusion of this talk. Um, I mean, this bias work. So uh, we tackle some realistic scenario, cross bias robustness. Um, and if your bias can be characterized by your model, um, this method is good candidate to use. 
And we extensively designed the experiments for evaluating the cross bias generalization, which is extremely hard to define. Um, our model consistently show better performance than baselines in um, various kinds of benchmarks. Okay. Um, actually, I have one more paper uh, with very short time, but let's briefly um, address the question first. Um, okay, so we have um, several questions from Naman Goyar. Um, okay, where's the starting point? Okay, can H6 be calculated if the number of parameters in FG model are different? Um, yeah, it is no problem because this um, method is actually calculate the um, covariance metrics between two um, features. So only, only required thing is we need um, match the dimension of the features of the FNG. So it is no care about, uh, we, we, don't care, we don't have to care about the number of parameters or are um, the architecture, but we only care about the dimension of the features. I think the common is still a um, similar question. And the last one, um, can one use a different model for intentionally biased model G from the original model F and does HC calculation support comparison between the F and G or do the intentionally biased model G has to be derived from the original model F. Um, let me think about it. Um, so I think uh, this question is about just setting G as uh, same as the F, right? Um, yeah, um, conceptually, um, there, it could be problematic um, because um, the basic scenario of this task is um, G, cannot be like, G cannot catch up F due to the architecture constraint. So if you have same F and G, it will just um, um, chase and catch problem, like um, no more minimax problem. Um, but in practice, uh, we show that, uh, we observe that it is still um, improves some such performance um, measured in our um, benchmarks. Uh, because we can interpret this one as, of course, uh, independence, but in, otherwise we can, uh, on the other hand, we can interpret this one as some regular, regularization term. So yeah, we add some regularization, um, so it could improve the performance. Yeah, that is our um, interpretation. Okay, thanks for your question. And uh, we have only five minutes and I have one short paper uh, which gives very cool results. Um, so previous paper, requires, or many other robust machine learning optimization requires very complex minimax optimization. So this optimization is very difficult because um, we have to find a set point in the image, I mean, in, in the low surface. Um, so careful choice of, of optimization parameters like learning rate or um, a momentum or something like that is very critical to the optimization. So we have two techniques to better optimization. First one is momentum method. So instead of just computing gradient as the um, update step, they just um, accumulate the update step for the faster convergence here. And the other one is batch normalization. Um, of course, uh, state-of-the-art um, networks all use this batch norm, and they enable to enlarge in the learning rate and they uh, make some scale invariance um, property. I don't want to say details of uh, all details here, um, but problem is that um, if we combine these two methods, momentum-based gradient method and um, normalization method, um, we have some problems. So momentum-based gradient descent has good properties like accelerate the convergence or easy to adopt or very good performances. But uh, if we just adopt this one to the normalization uh, with, with normalization, it excessively um, increased the weight norm, uh, weight norm here. So um, it results, in, uh, as a result, it quickly dropped the effective step to size and the practical convergence rate will be dropped also. So we recover this phenomenon and propose some solution in this um, recent paper um, named slowing down the weight norm, uh, weight norm increase in momentum-based optimizers. Um, this work is collaboration with Byung Ho, Song Jun Ho, Dong Yun Han, Sang Tu Yun, Yong Jung Ho, and Jung Ho Ha in Clobile Research. So we propose some simple um, solution here. 
Um, so let me skip the details, but you can you um, just focusing on here. Um, only difference of the SGD and our proposed SGDP is this projection. And same to the Adam P here. So it is very easy to adopt. And here is some simple simulation. Um, so this line is starting point and here is our target point. So this optimization minimize the um, cosine similarity between um, current weight and this um, target weight. So optimal weight will be um, aligned here. Um, one problem of the momentum is they increase non very fast like this, and it will decrease the rear effective step size in this um, effective um, sphere space. So you can see the details of the demo videos in this um, project page. Um, so we test this um, Adam P and SGDP on five tests and 13 data sets, different data sets. And of course, uh, the motivation here was minimum optimization. Uh, we achieved much better minimum optimization performance than um, final Adam. And it is also true for the bias again. Um, so improved by Adam P is um, here, is quite a lot, right? And of course, we have very good results set image net classification. Um, less than 50 plus commits achieves more than 78.3 um, um, accuracy. It's quite large. Um, and also, it works for the MS Coco object detection and audio classifications and image retrieval tasks. So, yeah, just run um, PIP into Adam P in your laptop and just run, replace your Adam to Adam P. That is all for, um, you know, um, run in this talk. So we recommend using default parameters except the learning rate. Uh, of course, we, you, you have to tune the learning rate. And the code is open source now, so you can access uh, freely. Okay, so um, we, we propose very good optimizer here. Um, so we are making very good progress like this um, in many fields, like um, reliable machine learning, powerful backbone networks, or generative models. Um, so we are hiring many positions like research scientists, um, engineers, and internships, and software engineers. So if you're, if you're interested in such um, positions, just take this QR code and um, take the form, please. Um, yeah, special thanks to Song Jun and Sang Du for great collaborations, and um, yeah, thanks for your listening. I'm very sorry for um, um, make no sl uh, slide for the Q&A session. Um, but, um, um, Youngmin, can you hear Youngmin, there? Yeah. Oh, hi, I'm here. Uh, can, I, can I use three more minutes for the Q&A? Oh, okay, of course. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Um, so we have, um, I think we have some questions. One question, okay. How does the bias match texture? What if there exists some biases in global features in data sets? So, oh, right. Um, very, very, very important question. Um, honestly, we don't know. We never know about it. Um, that's why this um, benchmark is hard to um, evaluate. So we provide, um, you know, we do our best um, in our situation. So. Of course, there will be much better way to measure the um, generalization performance here, like uh, collecting um, this kind of data set, like MIMTIX. Uh, but we didn't do that. Um, but we just uh, calculate the um, texture clusters. Um, instead of do that, uh, we also measure the proxy data sets, like image A and image C. And we got uh, consistent improvements here. So we believe that. Um, even though uh, these texture clusters are literally capture, even if it not capture textures really, um, it gives some improvements in terms of some generalization. That is our point. Okay. Okay. Thanks for coming my talk. And the next talk is by Youngmin Beck and uh, Visual Research uh, Visual AI Group in Global AI. Uh, let me stop share. Okay, thank you for coming.